hunt for it, find it, make it your own. It's the Get Thrifty Podcast. Welcome to the show. You have discovered the Get Thrifty Podcast brought to you by Arc Thrift Stores right here in colorful Colorado. Arc Thrift Stores is a Colorado thrift store chain. And if you're in Colorado or visiting us, please check out one of our 32 Front Range and Western Slope locations. You will not be disappointed. I am your host, Maggie Savick, and we are all about sharing everything that has to do with shopping secondhand. So if you're a person who's part of our unique thrift culture, please contact us. We'd love to promote your businesses and your social channels and share your stories and advice with our listeners. You can find us on Instagram at Arc Thrift. Send us a DM and let's chat. Ladies and gentlemen, this is totally out of my comfort zone. Very excited to bring you yet another resource with tax season right around the corner. Uh, Mark of Not Your Dad CPA is joining us today. I'm going to give you a little background on Mark and then we're going to dive in with quite literally one of the most uncomfortable conversations ever. Um, E-commerce, IRS, money, finance, all the things. Uh, But we think this will be a really great um, opportunity and a resource to all of our resellers out there listening or thinking about diving into the retail space. So Mark is a CPA who specializes in helping resellers optimize their taxes and profitability. After deciding that becoming a professional skateboarder wasn't in the cards, which we're going to ask why, he created Not Your Dad CPA. He has helped thousands of resellers save money and attain peace of mind about taxes. He also runs, runs his own reselling side business, so he knows a thing or two about how to navigate the tax and accounting side of e-commerce, which we're all wondering about. When not doing taxes or calming the fears of his clients about about taxes, you'll find him eating Mexican food, watching movies, playing volleyball, and hanging out with his family. He has an interesting story. I'm really excited. Mark, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks a lot. Happy to be here and talk about uh, all the stuff people don't really want to talk about, but feel like they have to this time Absolutely. Of year. And they really do have to. And I think, you know, as this podcast grows, we've got to be more of a resource. So we appreciate your time today. And um I think that this is going to be really interesting. It's totally, again, out of my comfort zone, but, uh, I, and I'm, I'm a little nervous. I rarely get nervous for these, but you got me nervous there. So let's start with, uh, your social handle and how you came up with this clever idea and your logo. Super cute. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I worked in public accounting out of college. I, you know, I studied accounting. I've worked a little bit in corporate finance, but along the way, I never wanted to do my own thing. I thought it was too cliche to go open your own little accounting firm and do taxes. But, you know, after a few years of being a CPA, I thought, you know what, I I am a CPA. I, I could do this for people if I wanted to. Why not just give it a try on the side and see if I like it? Um, so I don't know, just after a little while of thinking about wh- what I would want to call myself or call my brand, that just kind of came to mind. Um you know, I never wanted to be too formal or too traditional. I kind of always resisted that a little bit. And um, it just kind of, it kind of fit. And then yeah, as, as far as the, my original logo, it's got a guy there in a suit with a skateboard. And that's, I'm just trying to like, I, I really, my favorite part about this job is connecting with people and the relationships. It's not necessarily the taxes, but I like, I mean, I like saving you money on taxes. And I, I just, I really like getting to know people and, um, you know, showing people who I am and I'm not, I don't want to like hide behind a, a, you know, a secretary in a suit and all that. I'm that's just like, not for me. So. Well, I definitely think it it's definitely warm and approachable. I love that. I mean, I'm a marketing person myself, so I really was drawn to it. I was like, okay, that is super clever. And it really, it does invite people to just have a real conversation about what they're dealing with in terms of reselling. So tell us how you kind of got into this really niche market of helping resellers. How'd that come up? Yeah, around the same time that I started doing taxes for people, um, I also was doing a little bit of personal finance blogging. I was pretty active in that space for maybe two years um, and just just got to know some people in that space. And um, through some mutual connections, somebody contacted me and they say, hey, we know so-and-so and they recommended you and we have this podcast uh, with... 10,000 eBay sellers. We were wondering if you'd want to come on and 
you know, talk about taxes. And I didn't know anything about reselling. This is like 2015, I think. Um, I was like, how are there even 10,000 people out there who listen to a podcast about eBay? Um, there are. And, yeah, that was like a year or two still before I got into Instagram and saw that there's a whole world on there, mm-hmm. um, which I'm much more familiar with now, but that's kind of where it started. And I picked up some reseller clients from there and it just sort of snowballed until I said, you know what, I think I'm just going to make this my niche, my specialty. So, and that's also around the time when I started selling a little bit online myself. So it just sort of all came together at that same time. Yeah, that's perfect. And such a resource. I and mean, I think that's the probably one of the things that keeps resellers up at night is, you know, the tax end of it, um, but also the profitability. And I love you did a post, you know, I think you actually wrote, is your reselling business profitable? I and mean, what does that really mean? Yeah, different people would would present that uh, differently. And I have clients who new clients who thought they were profitable, but then it turns out that they're actually not making money or not making much they, as they thought, or the few fortunate ones where they think they're losing money and they're actually making money. That doesn't happen as often, but that happens too, just from uh, people not staying on top of the books like ideal. But yeah, the, the other thing is you see a lot of people online, influencers or whoever are talking about how much money they're making, but you never know. Are they talking about their gross profit? Are they talking about their their, like their overall sales? Are they talking about their net profit? Are they talking about their profit after tax? You know, there's so many different things they could be talking about. And yet we compare ourselves with like the perceived success of other people when we don't actually know, you know, it's still apples. It's not apples to apples. So there's just um, so much benefit you can get from getting on top of your tax situation, getting on top of your, your record keeping situation And it's not as it's, it does seem intimidating, but after you get into it, it's not as painful as most people um, imagine it will be. I'm I'm sure you've had some tough conversations though. I mean, that's, that has to be one of the hardest parts of your job is like, here's the reality of what I found after digging into your books. Does that happen often or is it surprisingly more successful than you would have thought? Yeah, it's, it, I mean, I see a whole range and I do a lot more tax preparation than I do bookkeeping. Uh, but I do have, you know, a, a dozen or so, maybe more bookkeeping clients. And occasionally I'll just help clean up people's books, even if they're not an ongoing client. And yeah, a lot of times in those situations, we'll we'll find that they're they're not making as much or they're losing more money than they thought. And then um, it is painful, but it gives them the opportunity to, opportunity to either reevaluate or just see what decisions need to be made. You know, mm-hmm. if, if you don't have that visibility into the the num- into your numbers, into the activity, your business activity, you don't even know what decisions you should be thinking about. Mm-hmm. It allows but, you to make a more educated decision about the future. I mean, are there really enough resellers out there? educate us about that. What have you learned? I mean, I know there's a lot, but like, is it like a limitless well? I feel like there's a limitless well of people I can interview for this podcast. It seems never ending. Is there a limitless well for you as well of people trying to make a living in this space that need your assistance? Yeah. I don't know the exact numbers, but who, who, who one of the platforms publishes a lot of those numbers. Is that like a, a thread up annual report? I want to say. I'm oh not, yeah. Um, But, but yeah, I mean, it, it only makes sense that it's growing. I mean, e-commerce, I don't think has slowed down any. Yeah. I don't know. From my perspective, like I'm not hurting for clients. Um, (laughs) I mean, yeah, I don't know. Millions. It's like, cause if you want to start a side hustle, it's, it's usually one of the, one of the most accessible things or simplest things we can do because we all have stuff lying around the house. And, And I have so many clients who never intended to be resellers, but they just started out selling a few things, um, just to try it out, just to make some extra money or or get rid of stuff out of the house. And they think, oh, wow, that was a lot easier than I anticipated. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should go out and try and buy some stuff for cheap and sell it for more. You know, it's it's the like the simplest thing you can do. And so many of those businesses have grown and and grown and maybe morphed into, I don't know, some people end up in consignment or they end up in wholesale. And it all started from just selling some old stuff from 
their house or from their grandma's attic or whatever. So it's, yeah. I mean, it's really cool journey to see. The sky's the limit. And you really have created this like reputation. I've had no through no fewer than three different resellers tell me that you are the reseller's best friend. Yeah, I don't I don't know why more people haven't jumped in the space. I mean, there there are a handful of companies or firms that do specialize in, in e-commerce, but maybe they just don't have as visible of a, a face, maybe. But yeah, I, I enjoy, I mean, I'm not an extrovert by any means, but I do like having an online presence and helping people feel more confident about, you know, the, the financial area of, of all that stuff. It's pretty exciting. And I do think it's the, you're, that you're approachable and easy to chat with. I'm thinking, oh, I need this guy to do my, my own personal taxes. Do you do personal taxes too, or do you just do reseller stuff? Uh, I definitely do personal because most resellers, and this is something that we would probably talk about anyway, are um, sole proprietors by default. So you don't actually have to go out and register a business. Like once you start selling things with the intent to make a profit, you are a sole proprietorship and sole proprietorship business activity is part of your individual tax return. It just goes on a separate schedule of your personal return. So just, just by virtue of that, I do a lot of individual returns that have the business piece attached to it. That makes it so much less scary, I think, that people don't have to go through, you know, these extra layers. It's just an added schedule that that does make it more accessible to people who might be a little freaked out about it. I do love you posted this meme it was so hilarious that from the office of Michael Scott and Toby, their conversation about the IRS. And it's like, why are you this way? with regard to your relationship with the IRS. I try and make things fun and exciting and you make it not that way. So I'm sure you have some stories, but I definitely want to get from you the tips for resellers as they get ready for tax season, which is right around the corner. Do you have like a list of a few that you can share with our listeners so that they can be um, ready to face this season? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely have a few specific uh, steps or tips I would give to someone starting out. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the first thing I would say to someone, like if I could only communicate one thing, I think the simplest, the biggest bang for your buck is just going out and getting a separate bank account. And it typically doesn't even necessarily have to be a business account. It could be a separate personal account if you're a sole proprietor. Um, and that's just going to make it that much easier for you to stay. Uh, it's going to set yourself up better for more success because I mean, most of us, when we start out, we're just using our, our personal account for our business stuff and for our personal stuff. And it's all mixed in there. So it just makes the, the waters even more muddy. We don't know, we can't, we don't have that visibility into our numbers uh, for our own benefit to make the decisions we need to make to drive our business forward. And it's also going to make preparing our tax return difficult because we have to go in there and try and remember and try and separate out all the business stuff. And it just gets, um, kind of messy. And then you're at risk of either understating your income, which the IRS is not going to like, or overstating your income, in which case you're not going to like because you're paying more tax that you otherwise maybe would not have had to pay. Yeah. Get the separate bank account. The, the next, I mean, even if that's all you do, that's going to make your life easier. But if you want to take it a step further, you could layer on some type of bookkeeping program. And that's just basically adding a little bit more automation to what you've already done. So if, if you get some software like QuickBooks, it links to your bank account. So it imports all your transactions and you can classify them uh, based on what type of expense it is. You know, is it supplies expense? Is it a software subscription? Is it a contractor expense? And then that gives you even better insights in your books and you can pretty easily run a like a profit and loss report where you can see how much you made for the month, how much you made for the year. You can leverage it for your taxes. So those would be my first, uh, first two tips. Okay. And would QuickBooks be your recommendation or you have any other software that you like for bookkeeping? Uh, yeah. Most accountants or CPAs, I, they have a, a love hate relationship with QuickBooks. I think, I mean, it is the market leader. It is really good software. Um, they just, it seems like they're always raising the price, you know, which nobody likes. Um, but yeah, that's what I use for all my uh, bookkeeping clients. It's probably what I, re I would recommend. They have a simpler version called QuickBooks Self-Employed, 
which I might recommend if you really value simplicity. Um, it It's limited in that it does not have asset or liability accounts. It just has income and expense accounts. If you want more of a robust or full-blown bookkeeping program, then you would get QuickBooks Online. So those are different. Um, and you can try them both out to see which you prefer. And there's also a, there's a free software out there called Wave Accounting, which is kind of like a, a free version of QuickBooks Online. And it, it can surprisingly do a lot of stuff. It just doesn't have, it just doesn't integrate with as many apps and things like that, or third-party apps like QuickBooks does. Um, does Wave integrate with your, um, with your bank account though? Yep. Yeah. There's no one size fits all. It, it just depends on how many platforms you sell on. Yeah. It just depends on different factors. Okay. So any thoughts on what people need to have ready to do their taxes or before they see their accountant, how can they be more prepared before they make the call to you for, you know, help? <laughs> yeah, that's, um, I mean, you're, yeah. So that's the biggest thing, just having a an annual summary of your income and expenses for your business. And that's going to be 90% of what you need for the business piece. And then maybe some things that your bookkeeping software might not pick up like your mileage. Mm. One deduction that people often forget about or or just don't track is your business mileage. Oh my gosh. Um, and and there's so much of that when you're thrifting. Yeah, that, that can really add up. I mean, you you have some people who maybe they just go to the post office a few times a week, but you have other people who are doing cross-country thrifting trips. Sourcing trips, yeah. Yeah, where you where you rack up thousands of miles and and yeah, they that that that's a deduction potentially worth thousands of dollars. So that's that's one that's important to track as well. Yeah, because there are deductions you can take on your taxes that you won't necessarily see on your books. Another one would be uh, the home office deduction for people who who have a, a space, an office space in their home that they use regularly and exclusively for the business. They most likely qualify to take the home office deduction. Ladies, your giant basement's filled with stuff. Yeah, some some people have use their entire basement as storage and their their working space so then you can basically take 50 percent of your your home costs and deduct those you know that's your oh, wow. utilities your mortgage interest or rent property taxes so yeah you'll need to need to know the square footage of that space as well as the square footage of your entire home so yeah just just having those business numbers ready to go as well as any tax forms you've received like w-2s 1099s things like that and and, and those forms are helpful too because sometimes somebody will send me their their profit and loss information, but then they'll send me a, maybe a 1099 from eBay and I'll see that they're, I mean, they're always going to be a little bit different. I wouldn't worry about that, but sometimes they're significantly different. So then I can say, then I can ask them a question say, Hey, this looks a little bit off. You know, do you have this other thing? Or, you know, then we can have a conversation and make sure that the numbers are accurate. Yeah. And that, that actually bring, when you said 1099, I remembered, um, Liz O'Kane told me about this, um, new law potentially coming up that 1099k coalition have you heard of this yep can you describe what that is to people it's it's something that uh, even as thrift store people we're thinking we need to help you know we need to get behind this to make it better so can you kind of give us a background on on what this could potentially mean to resellers toward the end of 2021 i think some i forget the name of the the bill or the the law but part part of the bill was reducing the 1099k threshold from twenty thousand dollars in two hundred transactions down to six hundred dollars, and Gosh, let me back up crazy. a little bit. So, so before people who sold over twenty thousand dollars and had over two hundred transactions on a platform like eBay, eBay was required to send them a ten ninety nine k form, basically just showing those sales, and they would also have to send that information to the IRS, so that if if you did not report that information on your tax return the IRS would know about it and they'll send you a letter. And I have people send me those letters all the time asking me what to do. One misconception is that I don't have to pay tax if I don't get a 1099, which is not true. Like even if I have a profit and I don't get a 1099 from eBay, I still have to report that information and pay tax on it. So then they said that starting 2022, anyone who sold over just $600 would be getting a 1099. That was going to put a big burden on the platforms like eBay, um, Poshmark, Amazon, Mercari, all the all the platforms, because all of a sudden millions and millions of more casual sellers would be getting 1099s. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's problematic for a few reasons because there's a lot of sellers out there who are not, don't even necessarily have businesses. Mm -hmm. They might have just sold one thing. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe they sold one thing. Uh, Maybe they sold one thing for $700 and maybe they had bought it a few years back for a thousand dollars. Yeah. They're actually losing money on it. Yeah. Yeah. So they have a loss, but the IRS doesn't know how much it costs you. But if you don't report it on your taxes, now they're going to be sending you a letter and say, Hey, you owe, you know, $200 of tax because you didn't report this $600. Mm-hmm. So then you either have to send them a reply or send them amended an amended tax return and say, no, actually I had a loss on this. So it's going to be, it was going to create like a huge fiascos for everybody. So much paperwork and the IRS is already behind. Like, how is this even going to go? I mean, what's your gut? What's going to happen to this? Well, I, I think it, I thought it was going to be a huge disaster and the, the IRS actually got enough pushback that just a few weeks ago, like just a week before 2023, they came out and they said, okay, actually, we're going to delay the implementation of this lower threshold until 2023. So the thresholds have remained the same for 2022, what we're doing taxes for right now. Um, and, and yeah, in the meantime, eBay and was it Mercari? I forgot who headed it up are bringing together the platforms who established this 1099k coalition Mm -hmm. and they're basically pushing back and um what's that word petitioning or lobbying congress and stuff to try and not have it go down to six hundred dollars but to keep it either keep it where it is or maybe something more reasonable like ten thousand dollars yeah so my guess is between now and then we might see it come up some um, kind of more reasonable amount that makes more sense and actually looks like a business. I'm just picturing like a little old lady who is literally the like you described a seven hundred dollar dining room table that she bought for a thousand dollars a couple of years before, and now she's getting a ten ninety nine. What extra paperwork? Lord have mercy. Yeah, there there would have been, and and maybe still will be a lot of confusion. Yeah, that uh, yeah, I don't know. That'll be exciting. I, I yeah. did a YouTube about a YouTube video about that not too long ago. I've got to get that because I we actually arc we utilize a lobbyist here for all sorts of things that when it comes to like disability legislation. But mm. I'm interested and I've talked to my CEO about this, and maybe this is something we need to get behind and you know, change the threshold. That's ridiculous. Six hundred dollars is absolutely ludicrous. It's really gonna impact these resellers who make a living off of buying from our stores. And why would we want to put any more roadblocks in front of them? That just sounds absolutely ridiculous i guess it'll mean more work for you but probably not fun work that you know is is good for these small businesses it just it blows my mind i'm i'm so glad though that our resellers have resources and someone like you who knows all the ins and outs of these things and that can really give tips and your website um and your instagram page again not your dad's cpa right that's the handle mm-hmm Okay. That's how people can find you. And what about, um, I've got on my show notes here, five resellers tips to optimize your tax situation. You already said, get a separate bank account, easy peasy Two, get your books up to date. And that means go ahead, expand on all that. Yep. And then um, I would also just evaluate your, your business entity type. And by that, I mean, are you a sole proprietor um, and, and should you be? Sometimes the next logical step is usually to move to an LLC, which is a, a limited liability company. And the, the main reasons you would want to do that, and, and not everybody needs to, I think most people are fine just staying as a sole proprietor, but sometimes certain vendors or wholesalers or maybe banks will require you to be an LLC for you to work with them. If you, if you, feel like you would benefit from the liability protection. You know, if you have personal assets you want to protect, or if you sell something that maybe is a little more, you know, likely to have any kind of, I don't know, lit- litigious, I guess. <laughs> um, what am I missing? Limited liability. The reason I like the LLC is because it's a stepping stone that you can use to become an S corp because an LLC has basically has the same tax implications as having a sole proprietorship. Like you don't, generate any tax savings just from getting an LLC. But you can realize a lot of tax savings in many cases from having an S corp, but you can't do an S corp without first being an LLC. 
critical information right there. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you you can be a, a, a corporation as well, but I typically don't recommend that for small businesses. So you do the LLC and then you can do what's called electing S corp status. Um, and then with an S corp, your profits are not subject to self-employment tax, which is something we can talk about too. Um, but when you, when you are selling stuff, when you have a side hustle or a side gig, or you're a sole proprietor, your profits, not only are subject to income tax, which we're all used to, but also self-employment tax, which is about 15%. So it's, it's a big chunk that a lot of new self-employed people have, um, get surprised by or blindsided by. I know I was when I first had self-employment income. So, and we can talk about that more, but I just wanted to say when you're, when you're a S corp, your profits are not subject to that self-employment tax. So you can save, you know, 10, $15,000 a year, depending on how much profit is. Yeah, that's huge. So no matter what, if you are um, either a sole proprietor or an LLC, you're subject to the self-employment tax. Yep. Okay. And the only way to get out of that is to bump up to that S corp. Yeah. And you still, one requirement of an S corp is that you pay yourself a salary. Mm -hmm. So that's unique to S corps and your, your salary is going to be subject to social security and Medicare. And that's basically going to be the equivalent of self-employment tax on a portion of your earnings, but everything left over after that is not subject to it. Not subject. Exactly. Yeah. That's really interesting. Okay. See, this is valuable information. I love it that we're actually being a resource to people that, that listen to this podcast. There's so many people that will reach out to us and say, oh, I'm thinking about it. Or maybe they don't even know that they actually kind of are already dipping their toe into it. And these kinds of things are, are critical. Um, and then you say, evaluate your business entity, make any final estimated tax payments and make a tax prep plan. Talk about a tax prep plan. What does that look like? Um, basically just, just knowing what you are going to do as far as getting your taxes done, you know, are you going to do it yourself or are you going to hire somebody? And, and not just the preparation piece. I should have said also like the, the planning piece, cause those are two separate things like the preparation, all the damage is already done. You basically, everything's set and you just have to take it and basically put it on paper, you know, file the mm -hmm. forms as best you can. But part of that plan should also be, okay, what am I going to do going forward? Part of that plan should include the things we've already talked about, you know, going forward, should I be an S corp? You know, can I save money doing that? Can I, you know, on my calendar, I'm going to put the dates when I should be making my estimated payments. So I'm not late and I don't incur penalties. Like what are all the things you can do that are going to add up to avoiding tax penalties and, and realizing more tax savings. The analogy I like to use recently is going to the dentist. You know, if, if you don't brush your teeth or floss all year and you show up and you say, okay, you know, fix me, there's only so much they can do. There's a lot of a damage that has already been done, but they can also say, okay, make sure you floss and, and brush and do all this, whatever else at, at this freq level of frequency. And that's really going to help you optimize and, and be in the best position going forward. And it's, I think it's the same with, um, with your tax and financial situation. Maintenance, constant maintenance on the, ba the back end of your business, super critical. And I think a lot of our resellers, at least the ones that we talk to, what they love is the sourcing, the thrifting, the, the going out there and finding that treasure to resell this stuff, not so much. So you are taking new clients, correct? Yep. Yep. Okay. And you do offer courses. Let's talk about this. You offer courses, you have suggested courses, suggested software you've kind of told us about. Um, how can people, you know, access these courses that you provide and, and really learn from you before they reach out and say, I'm totally screwed. I need your help. <laughs> yeah. So I have a, a, I'll mention the bookkeeping course first. That one's a little more specialized. Like if you know you want to do bookkeeping yourself and you want to use a program like QuickBooks Online, that's really who that program is for. Um, and then I have my Reseller Tax Academy, which is, I'd say, more um, applicable to, to almost every beginning reseller or maybe in a lot of intermediate resellers. And it just goes through a lot of things we talked about. You know, what are the things I need to, to know uh, about taxes, the different types of tax, um, you know, the different types of business entity, all the deductions, a little bit of bookkeeping in there as well, you know, 
planning. Basically, how do, how do I optimize my tax situation? But yeah, I, I think that one is is really, I mean, I've gotten a lot of good feedback on that. I do a typically do a sale every January, um, but but that's often where I encourage people to start. Reseller Tax Academy. Okay. Yep. Numero uno. And then um, in terms of, you know, other resources online, anything you want to recommend, social pages we should be following, um, any kind of resources out there that you think are really valuable to, you know, starting this process? Yeah. So, I mean, I try and put valuable information on my Instagram, my YouTube, uh, but it, but as far as doing your own research, I mean, you can always go to the IRS website that could, that can typically be pretty painful for people though. So if you want to go to other websites that do a good job of breaking down some of that stuff, like the, the TurboTax and H&R Block tax articles are usually pretty good. Where I see the worst information, honestly, is in the eBay and the Amazon forums. When people ask tax questions, you just get so many responses. <laughs> and some random replies with some yeah. bad information. I mean, you can often find good information in there, but it could be buried. You know, it could be an, obscure, an obscure comment buried in the bottom. So it's like, just be careful where that you is can... really good advice. Cause I think a lot of resellers go to the chat and ask a question in some random replies. That's really good advice. Avoid those people, avoid them. Yeah. Or yeah, just, it's just learning how to, how to filter between what, what's the good information and what's the not so good information. Um, I have a, a Facebook group called Accounting for Online Sellers. That's pretty good. I think I just requested to join that as a voyeur so I could watch and mm, see. Perfect. Yeah. I want to see who joins it and and um, just see what people are chatting about. So that's cool. So th is that kind of a forum where people can chat and then you can kind of say, uh, that's bad info? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I try and chime in a lot. And there's there's people in there now who who are pretty knowledgeable. So So there's some good discussion in there common questions answered. Okay. Well, let's get into that. I mean, we've, I, is there anything else, any other sage words of wisdom or advice you want to offer to listeners before we get a little more silly <laughs> as we like to do on this podcast? Oh man. Um, yeah. I mean, there's so many, there's just so many common questions like we haven't even touched on and probably don't even have time to just a lot of things people wonder about, like, okay, you know, what the deductions should I know about? How do I deduct inventory? You know, should I, keep my receipts, um, you know, hobby versus business. Like there's, there's so many directions to go, but I guess the overall thing I would say is um, just don't, don't stress about it too much. It, like, like I said, I, I'll often have a consultation call with somebody and they, they might think we need an hour and we finish in 15 minutes. And they always say, oh my gosh, that didn't take nearly as long as I thought. And it's not as near, it's not nearly as complicated as I thought it would be. Um, so it, it's just a matter of, getting over that, that initial, whatever, that initial hump or that obstacle or whatever, just making yourself talk to somebody or, you know, sign up for the course or watch the video or just do that initial amount of research where you can, you know, start um, realizing it's not as bad as you thought. Mm -hmm. and, and and maybe that won't always happen. I guess some, sometimes people get started and things just get super overwhelming. Maybe that's the point at which you should, you should talk to somebody. I guess that's true because a lot of times I'll talk to people who are pretty stressed even after searching for stuff, but it's because they don't know where to search. So mm -hmm. if you can talk to somebody who can kind of steer you and say, this is what you should be doing you'll say, oh, okay, I feel much better now. I'll just keep doing this for now. You're kind of like a therapist too. I mean, you're, you're getting people over some fears and, you know, showing them up the path of least resistance. Um you're, you're doing, you're doing a serious service for a lot of people. It's pretty exciting. I'm pretty blown away. I gotta say, very nervous about this. Hopefully we hit the high points though. And you said you were comfortable with a couple of, you know, crazy questions like, you know, tell us about it. A, a, and if you don't want to use names, that's fine. But like your unicorn client, the one who like sells the weirdest stuff and maybe a client who like makes the most money selling what? Give us a give us a little insight into some of your most unique and uh, strange clientele. Yeah, one of the ones who makes the most money, he's been with me a few years, and I think I started doing his taxes before he was even doing over a million in sales. But the past few years, he's done several million in sales, and that's not super unique. But his, his profit margins are also excellent; like his his profits are up in the millions of dollars as well. Incredible. Yes, and it's it's primarily Amazon. And he does um, 
I don't know how specific I get, but he just, he does games. I love it. Like online games. Wow. Okay. Kind yeah, of. Well, yeah. Like, like card games and stuff that you, oh. people order and he ships to him. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. So that guy's making a lot of money and selling something weird that kind of kills two birds with one stone. What else? Any kind of weird things that people are selling? That one's, you know about? that's not, not as weird. And this person, actually, I don't even know if they're a client, but maybe they used to be a client. I did taxes for one person, but he would, he was asking me questions about some tax questions he had for his girlfriend's business about if, if she, (laughs) if she could deduct food because she used food in her videos. And I was like, Oh, I don't know what, what kind of videos are we talking about? Like (laughs) AMSR or ASMR? How do you say it? Yeah, yeah, I don't know if it was ASMR. It was more like on the risque spectrum. Oh, how funny. Involving like lots and lots of food. You know what? The weirder, the better on this podcast. I stopped asking questions, so that's all I know. Sometimes you don't want to know, you know? But but I did say I thought she could deduct it as cost of goods sold, if you're wondering. That's incredible. (laughs) Okay, so you are taking new clients. People can reach out to you again. It's not your dad's CPA. Is that all the places we could find you on Instagram and um, your website as well, correct? Yep. Not your dad's CPA.com. And you know you've gotten to the right place if you see a guy in a suit holding a skateboard, skateboard which again, such a warm and welcoming branding tool. I love it. And I always say, Mark, on this podcast, we're devoted to spreading the good word of thrift. And, you know, you're doing something really special. Um, People like you are making this podcast possible and you're keeping all these resellers fiscally sound. So congratulations on all your work and thanks for your service. We're grateful for you. Yeah, appreciate it. Happy to be here and help. It's very exciting. And um, as always, we like to end our podcast and you are not exempt from this question. Anything you'd like to say about our sweet friend, one Miss Dolly Parton? I'm probably not as familiar with her or as big as a fan as you are, but she does have, I think, a special place in my heart because when I was, um, let's see, 15 years ago, I guess. So my son just turned 15. You know, she has her imagination library program with the books, which I had no idea even existed, but somehow my wife got signed up. So and we were, I mean, I was young and married and, and had like no money. I mean, that, that's the time in my life when I would frequent the garage sales or my wife would and just be like, you know, we wouldn't spend more than $5 on just trying to get onesies and little like blankets and stuff for the baby. And it's just like financially stressful. So it was just really, I just really appreciated the fact that, you know, she had this program and they sent us these books. And I think we did that with our first and second and maybe our third, but that was just, I thought that was really cool. And I know she's involved in a lot of that stuff. So absolutely. No, I love that. And you at the time, were you living in Las Vegas or Utah, somewhere on the West? No, we were actually in the Midwest at that time. We were in Indiana. Oh, wow. And you do a lot of travel like this life of, you know, CPAing for resellers has afforded you kind of a fun life. Are you willing to talk about that? And you're, you know, kind of how you and your wife live your life kind of with travel and everything. Yeah, we were both really um, interested in that. And um, I guess backing up a few years, we we always really wanted to go live abroad somewhere like that's we had been thinking about that the first 10 years of marriage. And finally, we said, OK, let's let's do it. And like five years ago now, we we left for a year and lived in in Central America. So cool. Um, in Nicaragua, actually. So we were there for a year and it was just, I mean, it was awesome. It was crazy. It was harder than we thought. Um, and that's actually where I really started. That's kind of where I started going deeper into reselling. And when I came back to the States, I was just basically full-time in this space. Um, but yeah, since then we, we went two years ago, we went to Mexico for two months. We just recently got back from Costa Rica Incredible. where we wanted to go back and visit Nicaragua, but my a lot of my clients know that my my six year old daughter had an accident. She broke both her arms, so we ended oh up gosh. staying in Costa Rica for the whole time. Um, and she's okay, but but yeah, we're scary. <laughs> yeah, we're we're getting like it's hard not to get entrenched in your day to day routine. You know, the kids get older; they have more activities, more school and stuff. But mm-hmm. we're just trying to resist that as much as we can. We're like, okay, where you know, where can we go? What can we do? How can we yeah. not be so traditional? 
And, and no wonder you appeal to this reseller lifestyle because a lot of people in this business, that's what they're trying to do, have as much freedom as possible and resist the norms of you know society, especially with their kiddos. A lot of homeschool moms that want to travel and are able to afford this life as a result of this. So I love it. You're like living this life of the reseller. It really, um, again, I think that's what appeals to a lot of these resellers and who come to you. So again, very grateful. Check them out. Not your dad's CPA. Anything else you want to share with our listeners before we let you get out of here? I don't, yeah, I don't think so. Just uh, it's, it's, it's going to be okay. Just put in a little bit of work and uh, I think it'll be worth it. It's going to be okay. Love it. Perfect ending. Thanks so much for joining us, Mark. We're grateful. And listeners, thanks so much for tuning in to the Get Thrifty podcast. A reminder, please save our podcast and leave us a five-star review about how funny, creative, and smart we are. And if you're part of this unique thrift culture and you'd like to be on this podcast, even if you're a CPA, send me an email, maggie at arcthrift.com, or reach out via Instagram at arcthrift and now on TikTok at arcthriftstores. Thanks so much and have a wonderful week. This podcast was powered by Arc Thrift Stores and edited by Avocet Communications.